Hello everyone, uh, so I am Dr. Ramesh Ramapanikhar, an associate professor in the chemistry department at Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. Uh, I was talking to you in the previous classes about the chemistry of haloalkanes and haloarenes. So, we would continue to do that today. So, in the previous two lectures that I have given, I have talked to you about the classification of organohalogen compounds, so, uh, the, about their physical properties a little bit then also about how the nature of these bonds are and how to classify them and give them names, the proper nomenclature according to IUPAC. So, it can, I would uh, slightly discuss something that we discussed towards the end of the last lecture that is the reaction of haloalkanes and how they undergo nucleophilic substitution reactions. So, we have seen that uh, nucleophilic substitution reactions of haloalkanes are probably the most discussed and the most useful reactions of them uh, and they are generally of two types and we started off by saying that the first type is something that can be called as nucleophilic substitution uh, reaction which are bimolecular or in other words substitution nucleophilic bimolecular reactions which has to be represented as SN2 where S stands for substitution N for nucleophilic and 2 stands for the bimolecular nature of the reaction. So, here you would see that in the screen I have a representation which we have already seen. So, this is just to tell you that this reaction happens when a nucleophile approaches an alkyl halide from a side opposite to where the carbon halogen bond is and then the carbon halogen bond starts to weaken and a carbon nucleophile bond starts to form. So, in the example that I have on the screen, uh, the nucleophile is a hydroxide anion. So, it reacts through the oxygen atom. So, we would see that we have a transition state in which there is an oxygen carbon bond slightly being formed and the carbon chlorine bond uh, getting weakened. So, methyl chloride is the haloalkane that is being discussed in this example. And this transition state, I also said that in this transition state, we have a planar structure of the carbon atom which is attached to three different hydrogen atoms and then you would see that through one of the sides, we have the chlorine atom leaving and through the other side, a hydroxide anion starting to form a bond. And this transition state then collapses to give us the product, in this case an alcohol plus a halide anion. The mechanism as it is shown here was first proposed by Hux and Incold and uh, the main features, salient features of the reaction can be summarized in a few points which says that this is a second order reaction that means the reaction has, uh, the rate of the reaction is affected by the concentration of the nucleophile as well as the concentration of the haloalkane. It is a single step reaction, so there are no intermediates are formed, we only have a transition state which is represented uh, here. Um, the transition state of course is a penta coordinate carbon atom uh, and the reaction happens with an inversion of configuration. So, this is a result of the nucleophile approaching uh, the carbon atom from a side opposite to where the carbon halogen bond is and when the halogen leaves it looks as if we started with an umbrella and have kind of inverted it and so therefore this is uh, we say that the SN2 reaction substitution nucleophilic reaction follows an, um, an inversion of configuration when the reaction actually happens. So, then we went ahead and said how exactly this reaction can be viewed for a practical purpose and here I had examples where a methyl halide, an ethyl halide, an isopropyl halide and a tertiary butyl halide undergoes reaction and we saw that the reactivity pattern in general is more for methyl then for other primary halides, secondary and tertiary follows and tertiary alkyl halides being extremely sluggish when it comes to nucleophilic substitution reactions through the bimolecular pathway. And this was explained through these pictures where you see that a nucleophile is trying to approach this carbon atom, but if there are only hydrogen atoms present on the carbon to which the nucleophile has to bond to, then the approach is rather uh, hindrance free. So, there are no steric crowding offered by the hydrogen atom which are extremely small. So, therefore, this reaction happens and if we put a relative rate of 30 for a methyl halide, then we would find that the corresponding ethyl halide reacts with a rate of 1. So, there is a difference of 1 to 30 when an ethyl or methyl reacts and this hindrance comes of course, because in this case we have an R group that is a CH3 in this case. So, this R group offers some hindrance uh, to the nucleophile. And if you replace two of those hydrogen atoms and put two methyl groups, then of course, the hindrance is more. So, therefore, the rate falls even from 1 and it becomes 0 0.02. And a tertiary butyl 
uh, halide, uh, as shown in this case, has three R groups for for tertiary butyl, three methyl groups. So when the nucleophile finds it extremely difficult to reach the carbon atom to start making the bond that is required for an SN2 reaction, so therefore rate of this reaction is practically zero. So this is what we discussed, and we said that SN2 follows the route primary greater than secondary and tertiary. Uh, that is how the rate of the reaction would be. Okay. So now what we would do is we would go and look at the second mechanism by which a nucleophilic substitution reaction can happen. And this is called substitution nucleophilic unimolecular or SN1. So the previous one was SN2 and this is called SN1. And the 1 of course stands for unimolecular reaction. That means the this particular reaction would depend only on the concentration of one of the substrates. So in this case the haloalkane. Uh, so we would have a look at this particular reaction. You can see, uh, so what I have here is an example on the screen and in this particular example, I have 2 bromo 2 methyl propane. So this is a carbon atom that is attached to bromine and 3 CH3 groups. Now it is being reacted with an alkoxide anion and what you would find is that uh, the reaction proceeds to give you 2 methyl propanol, prop 2 ol which is tertiary butanol and a bromide anion. Now uh, here I have a representation of the same molecule. So uh, you can see that there is a carbon atom attached to a bromine and 3 CH3 groups. Now how exactly this reaction happens is that it, it does not go uh, how the SN2 reaction did happen. That means the nucleophile does not start to approach the molecule. And it is clear in this case that because it is a tertiary butyl halide, it is bulky, so the nucleophile finds itself difficult to approach the carbon atom. So therefore what happens is when uh, this particular substrate, this particular halide is taken in a solvent, over a period of time in an extremely slower process, the bromine carbon bond can cleave. A carbon halogen bond is already polarized with a considerable amount of negative charge on the bromine atom and a positive charge on the carbon atom. Now with time what would happen is the carbon bromine bond would break and then we get what is called as a carbocation. So it is a cation centered on carbon. So we call it as carbocation. A more appropriate term for this is carbinium ion but it can also be called as a carbocation. So in this carbocation the structure of the carbocation is such that the carbon in this case is sp2 hybridized. That is we have a carbon that has 3 bonds which are sp2 bonds which are in a plane. So if I hold the carbon like this you would find that it has 3 hydrogens which are attached and all of them can be combined in a particular plane. Now what else does the carbon have is a p orbital. So the p orbital would be perpendicular to the plane in which the carbon and hydrogens lie and uh, the p orbital would have both of its lobe on either side of this particular plane and the p orbital is empty. So this does not have an electron that is why carbon has a positive charge. So that is how a carbocation would look and now this carbocation then stays in the solution in which the reaction is being done and it then reacts with the nucleophile that it is being treated with. So now the carbocation can react through its empty p orbital and during the process the hybridization of the molecule changes to sp3 and finally we get an sp3 hybridized tertiary butyl alcohol as the product. So you would find in the two reactions that I have written here, it has a first step where the carbocation is being formed. It is rather reversible because the Br- can come back and react with this cation and give us the starting material back. So it is a reversible reaction. So it would be appropriate to write it in an equilibrium. And once the carbocation formed, which is a slower process, the carbocation now has two options, either react with Br-, go back to where it started from or it could react with the nucleophile giving us a product. So the nucleophilic unimolecular substitutions are therefore, um, for, for the, they therefore follow first order kinetics. That means their rate is dependent only on the concentration of the haloalkane because the slowest step of the reaction which determines the rate of the reaction is uh, only dependent on how much of haloalkane is present because the reaction yields a carbocation. So the concentration of the carbocation is the one that determines uh, the future reactions.
Okay, so this is the simplest of representation. So now let us go for, forward and summarize what are the main points here. So the reaction of course follows first order kinetics. Now it is a two step reaction unlike the SN2 reaction which was a single step having a transition state. This is a two step reaction. So therefore the reaction has an intermediate. So there is an intermediate. It is not necessary that we will be able to isolate the intermediate but there is an intermediate formed and that is a carbocation an unstable intermediate which would then react with the nucleophile. So now this compound, so therefore of course what kind of haloalkanes can give this reaction effectively? If that is a question that is being asked, the answer is pretty clear. Any compound that can give stable carbocations, relatively stable carbocations would be able to push the equilibrium of the first step towards formation of more amount of carbocations and therefore make the SN1 reaction faster. So therefore we could summarize that the general reactivity order of haloalkanes towards the SN1 reaction is tertiary greater than secondary greater than primary. So this is exactly opposite to that of what an SN2 reaction followed. So in this case the tertiary reacts faster, secondary reacts slower than tertiary and primary reacts the slowest. And methyl uh, halomethanes generally do not follow this mechanism because it is extremely difficult to make a methyl carbocation. So this is something probably you have already learnt. Now, uh, so when we talk about the stability of carbocations, there are two molecules, two kinds of species that uh, those are worth uh, listening to. So one of them is allylic and the other is benzylic halides because when these molecules undergo an SN1 reaction, they form the corresponding allyl cation and benzyl cations. So I have the simplest unsubstituted allyl and benzyl cations written on the screen here. So you can see that an allyl cation has a positive charge and the positive charge is immediately adjacent to a double bond. So now the electrons in the double bond would be able to have a resonance relations with the carbon bearing the uh, positive charge and have these two resonance structures. So this particular cation is stabilized by two resonance structures and therefore it makes the carbocation more stable. So it is unlike having a simple primary carbocation, here the carbocation is uh, the positive charge is shared between two primary carbocations so it becomes more stable than a single uh, simple primary carbocation. Similarly in the case of benzyl cations the positive charge on the CH2 is shared through resonance with three other carbon atoms that are present in the benzene ring or in other words the benzene ring using its electron cloud supports the formation of this positive charge because the positive charge once it is formed on the carbon adjacent to a phenyl ring uh, there is large amount of elect uh, aromatic electron cloud that those are present in uh, that is present in the benzene ring so which would be able to support the carbocation or for or its formation and the resonance structures can be drawn as I have shown here. So therefore both benzyl and allyl cation remains to be stable carbocations and as we have seen in one of the points here stable carbocations support SN1 reactions. So you would find that when you try to do a nucleophilic substitution reaction on allyl or benzyl compounds they are relatively faster. So those are the main points here that one should look. So with these points you would also be able to distinguish between an SN2 and SN1. Primary difference is their uh, kinetics where SN2 is second order follow second order kinetics, SN1 reactions follow uh, first order kinetics. Then the order of reactivity also varies for an SN2 it is primary greater than secondary greater than tertiary here in SN1 reactions it is exactly the opposite. Okay. Now to understand these reactions better, um, so we have said that for example in the case of an SN2 reaction there is an inversion of configuration. So it, it would become important that at this stage we start looking at uh, carbon as a tetrahedral species and understand what exactly an inversion mean to uh, something like a tetrahedral structure. So in order to understand that we should start talking about molecular asymmetry that means molecule, the symmetry of a molecule and or the lack of it. So if a molecule does not have symmetry we call it as an asymmetric molecule, if a molecule has symmetry we call it as a symmetric molecule. So a, a term that is often discussed with in this context is chirality or a chirality or a chiral compounds or chiral materials and achiral materials. So I have some examples that would probably uh, get you used with this particular concept. So what we can say that if you take an object, so let us start with an object as simple as a funnel that I have shown here. So, so this is a funnel that you see here, right? So and then 
the plane that I have drawn, so I put a dotted line, so I assume that it is a mirror and what you see on the other side is the mirror image of the funnel. So now if you look at these two images, they are exactly identical. So you would probably be very easily able to take one of the structures that is either the mirror image or the original one and you can get confused between the two or in other words these two would look exactly the same. So if I have to take one of the structures and put on top of the other that would be an easy job. So therefore we can say that um, the mirror image of a funnel actually superimposes on its uh, on its actual structure. That means you take a funnel, take its mirror image, they are super impossible. That means I can take one and put on top of the other and it would match exactly. So if that happens, then those kind of molecules la uh, are symmetric. So they are symmetric molecules, their mirror image and the original molecules are the same. Now for certain molecules, it will not be possible that you can take the mirror image and put it on top of the other. Because when you take the mirror image and try to keep it on top of the original image, you would find that they do not fit well so or in other words they are not super impossible. So such substances are called chiral compounds. So chiral compounds are those compounds for which the actual object and its mirror image are not super impossible, cannot be put together. Now if a molecule has this property of having a mirror image which is not super impossible on itself then we say that property as chirality. So chirality is a property by which a molecule distinguishes itself from its mirror image that the mirror image cannot be superimposed on its actual structure. Now so as we have seen symmetric objects which are superimposable on their mirror images are said to be achiral. So that means they are not chiral, they are achiral. So now here I have an example of an achiral object. So I would try to show that structure to you. So you can look at your screen and you would see that there I have an object where from a point you would start to see that there is a red object, there is a blue object and there is a green object attached to a particular point. So this is exactly what I mean. So let me have the structure for you. Uh, so what you see here is a carbon atom that is attached, uh, let us call this as an atom that is attached to three different uh, units here. One of them is red, another is blue and I have a green on the, green on the third place. Now if I take a mirror image of this, this is how the mirror image would look. So if I keep a mirror on this side, you would see that this is the mirror image. Now if I turn the molecules towards you, you can see that one has the red sphere on the right hand side, the other one has it on the left hand side. So now these two are mirror images, but now if I try to take the mirror image and try to superimpose it on, uh, on the actual image, you would find that I cannot do that. So when I try to put the green on green, the blue is on red and the red is on blue. So there is no way that I can rotate this and actually see if I do it like that then of course the structures are not really correct. These again are mirror images. So I will not be able to superimpose this structure on this because this unit that I have shown here is asymmetric. Remember that the whole structure is not planar. If it is planar then I would be able to do that. Here I have a, an angle between these two bonds which is not 120. So this is kind of a pyramidal structure and this pyramidal structure leads to with three different substituents on it actually leads to a chiral object and this chiral object is not superimposable on its mirror image. Now coming back to molecules, so what we can say is that and if an organic molecule the same way, if it is not superimposable on its mirror image then we can say that that particular molecule is asymmetric or we call such molecules as asymmetric molecules. So let me take an example of such a molecule, so here now I have made the earlier structure into a carbon. So now what you see is a carbon atom which is black in color attached to four different functional groups. So one can be a chloride, one can be a bromide, iodide and hydrogen. So let us imagine a compound with four different substituents. Now this particular structure, this particular carbon atom which is the central carbon atom is now asymmetric. The reason is it does not have a plane of symmetry. You cannot use a plane of symmetry to cut this. If I cut this molecule, you would see that the two sides uh, have different substitutions. So it lacks symmetry units and now if I try to make its mirror image, you would also find that these two mirror images are not super impossible on each other. So this is one of the structures, this is its mirror image. Now I will not be able to superimpose it, uh, these two structures because I have the uh, red and the white coinciding together but you see that the blue and, uh, blue and green atoms are mismatched. So, so this tells you that this kind of a carbon atom that is attached to four different groups here, so that leads to asymmetry in the molecule. So 
such a carbon atom that is attached to four different units are normally called as an asymmetric carbon or such a center is called as a, as a stereo center because these two molecules now the actual molecule and its mirror image are not superimposable they are different molecules and these are isomers such isomers are called stereoisomers and because they are stereoisomers the carbon that is uh, responsible for the formation of these stereoisomers are normally called as called as a stereo center or they are also called as an asymmetric carbon in simple words if you find an organic molecule that has only one car that has at least one carbon atom that has one carbon atom that attached to four different functional groups then you can immediately say that that particular molecule is asymmetric so the condition is this if a molecule has one carbon atom attached to four different units then it is asymmetric if there are two or three then there could be cases where the symmetry uh, symmetry is retained so uh, normally we would only say that if a molecule has one carbon atom attached to four uh, different functional groups then the molecule is asymmetric so let us go forward and um, see how this becomes important and why how can we distinguish between such molecules so to discuss with that we also need to understand another important point which is uh, about uh, plane polarized light or uh, which is related with plane polarized light and the property of the molecules of organic molecules related to optical activity so I have already told you that these two molecules which are mirror images that cannot be distinguished uh, th that can be distinguished from each other that cannot be superimposed are stereoisomers. So now stereoisomerism is also associated with optical activity. So I will try to tell you what exactly is optical activity. So you can see a drawing here. So in this drawing what I have shown uh, I have represented normal light with a number of arrows in all directions. So what do we actually mean by that is when whenever we take normal light you would find that it has its electromagnetic vectors going in all directions so uh, if the light trans uh, starts to travel from one side to the other it would have its electromagnetic vectors going in all directions which are perpendicular to the direction of propagation of light so if light goes this way it has its vectors going in all the directions now there are certain kind of compounds which are called as polarizers an example is a nicole prism which I have shown here so if now this kind of a light that has its uh, uh, electromagnetic vectors going in all the directions so if it starts to pass through such a prism what happens is uh, after passing through polarizer what comes out is light that has these electromagnetic components only in one direction or only in one plane so all the other things are cut off so this is a property of the material from which the polarizer is made so now the polarizer is a material that is able to cut uh, the electromagnetic uh, components of light in all direction except for in one plane so what results is a plane polarized light so now we can say that now this light is polarized because it only has this electromagnetic components in one particular plane so which is normally represented by these double headed arrows that I have shown here indicating that we have these magnetic vectors which are moving only in only through one plane okay so we can convert a normal light into a plane polarized light now what next if the plane polarized light is allowed to pass through a solution of an organic compound which is asymmetric so that is the important point here so if you have a solution of an organic compound in some solvent and if the organic compound is asymmetric what happens is the plane of the plane polarized light so let is assume that my hand represents the plane of the plane polarized light so now if the plane of the light is like this once it passes through the solution it just tilts either towards the right side or towards the left side so when I am looking at it if it rotates to my right side it is in the clockwise direction and if it rotates in the left to the left side it is in the anti-clockwise direction so now again uh, the main point is a plane polarized light passing through a solution of an asymmetric organic compound would tilts it direct will tilt it direction and the direction would be either to the right or to the left which depends uh, on the asymmetric compound that I have dissolved in the solution now what you would see that the plane of the plane polarized light is now rotated or it is tilted which can actually be detected so the detector can also have a polarizer kind of compound which can detect the angle by which this is now tilted so there can be a detector that is able to do this and find that the plane of the plane polarized light has changed to one side so this molecules which are able to do this are said to be optically active because they do something to 
light. So, therefore, asymmetric organic molecules, asymmetric molecules in general, you would find most of them to be organic compounds. So, asymmetric molecules, asymmetric organic molecules are compounds that are optically active. So, they are able to rotate the plane of the plane polarized light either towards the right or to the left. Now, if the rotation is to the right, that is to clockwise when I look at it, then it is called dextrorotatory and if it is to the left, or in the anti-clockwise direction, it is called levorotatory. So, these two terms are from Greek, uh, which means that rotating to the right or rotating to the left. So, these are the terms that are used by organic chemists. So, if I say that I have an asymmetric compound and it is dextrorotatory, that simply means that if I make a solution of that compound, it would rotate the plane of the plane polarized light towards the right. And dextrorotatory is normally indicated by the sign D, which stands for dextro, or you can also represent it using a plus sign. This is just to say that the light tilts in the positive direction and the levorotatory is represented by L or a minus sign, that means it rotates in the negative direction. So, these are conventions that were used uh, from the time they were observed. Now, how, how it again becomes important is if an asymmetric compound is dextrorotatory, that means if an asymmetric compound, you are given an asymmetric compound, that means this is a compound uh, whose mirror image does not superimpose. So, the compound and its mirror image are different. Now, if the compound that is given to you is able to rotate the plane of plane polarized light to the right, then of course, its mirror image, which is a different compound, would be able to rotate the plane of the plane polarized light to the left. And now, if you take solutions having equal concentrations of both these molecules, that means the original molecule and its mirror image, the angle by which the light is rotated would also be same, except that they would be in the opposite directions. So, therefore, such molecules which are mirror images of each other and are able to rotate the plane polarized light in opposite directions are called enantiomers. So, enantiomers as I, I have written here, so you can see the term on the screen. So, uh, this can also be described as asymmetric carbon atoms which, so an enantiomers are those compounds whose mirror images are not superimposable on each other. So, if you have a compound whose mirror image is not superimposable on the actual structure, then that means they are, they form enantiomers and they would be optically active and they both would rotate the plane polarized light to equal but opposite directions. So, these compounds are therefore also called optical isomers. So, if you hear the term optical isomers uh, mentioned with respect to a compound, that simply means that the compound is asymmetric and that particular compound would rotate the plane of the plane polarized light in one direction and its mirror image would rotate the plane of the plane polarized light in the opposite direction. So, that is the point. So, we have instruments which can actually be used to detect in what direction the light is being rotated and such instruments are called polarimeters. So, polarimeter is normally found uh, in organic chemistry labs where the research is being done. So, if you find a molecule being synthesized, uh, if you synthesize a molecule, then one of the steps is to go and check what is the uh, polarity of the molecule or to check whether the more compound is asymmetric by uh, looking at in which direction uh, the light is rotated, the plane polarized light is rotated. Okay. So, now uh, to come back to this optically active compounds that I was telling you, the requirement is that you should have uh, molecules which are mirror images of each other and which are not superimposable. So, this was an example that we discussed. These are mirror images and you can see that they are not superimposable on each other. So, now I would uh, ask you to concentrate on the screen where I have these molecules here. So, I have an example here which is uh, but two, butan 2 all or 2 butanol. So, now uh, if you look at this compound, there is a carbon atom on this and it is attached to four different units one CH3, which is given in pink, an ethyl group, which is given in green, a hydrogen in blue, and an OH in red. Now, uh, here I have separated the two molecules through a line through the middle and this actually let us assume that it is a mirror and the mirror image is on the other side. You can see everything is same except that they look like exact mirror images. Now, if I rotate this molecule and try to put it on top of the other, try to superimpose them, I would find that they do not superimpose. You have already seen that with the models. So, as long as the four substituents are different, they will not be able to superimpose on each other. So, these are therefore called enantiomers. So, what I have here are enantiomers of butan 2 all. So, these are enantiomers of 2 butanol and they are not superimposable on each other. So, they are optically active, 
the compound butanol 2 butanol is therefore asymmetric so it can have two isomers and the isomers are only distinguished by their stereochemical orientation their orientation of the groups in space so that they are distinguished from their mirror images um, so we can say that the compound is optically active so i i also have another structure here which is just propanol so so propan to all or isopropanol now isopropanol is the immediate relative of butanol so it is a lower analog now uh, if i have to show that molecule so this is probably how i can show so let us assume that uh, these two white balls here are the hydrogen at, uh, or let us call them as the ch3 atoms and then if you assume that one of them is oh and the other one is uh, ch3 uh, other one is a hydrogen so so this is the compound here so this compound is different from the previously asymmetric compounds that I discussed because they have two of the groups similar. An asymmetric carbon atom had all the four functional groups different. So, this has two of them same. So, now if I take these two molecules and if I try to make a mirror image of this, this is what I get. Now, you can see that if I try to superimpose it like this, it does not work. But of course, I can rotate this molecule and then superimpose it. You see the two hydrogens are on top of each other the two CH3s are on top of each other and the two red balls. So, let us call them as red, black and white balls. So, you can see that the white balls are superimposable around exactly on top of each other. So, are the black and the red. So, if, if any of the two functional groups on a carbon atom are same, then the carbon is no more asymmetric. So, propanol, propan 2 all is such an example and you can see that their mirror images are superimposable and therefore, the molecule is not optically active. So, these are the two examples. Now, so, we have seen that a solution of one enantiomer, so solution of one of the stereoisomers would rotate the plane polarized light in one direction. Now, what would happen if I mix it with the other isomer? So, that means if I take a solution that contains both the isomers, that means the original compound and its mirror image in equal amounts. So, if that happens, what would happen is the original compound would rotate the line to plane polarized light to the right, the other one would rotate to the left. The net result would be that it does not rotate in any direction and I will see that the plane polarized light comes straight. So, therefore, uh, that kind of mixtures which are now optically inactive, although the solution has optically active compounds in them, the both the isomers are in equal amounts and then effectively turning them into optically inactive and such mix mixtures are called racemic mixtures. So, a racemic mixture is a mixture of two enantiomers of a compound in equal amounts in solution. So, now uh, normally, so when you want to represent a molecule as a racemic mixture, we do not write D or L, instead we write D and L together. So, if you say that a compound is a DL mixture, that tells you that it is a mixture of both the enantiomers and therefore, it is optically inactive. They can also be represented with a plus or minus sign, plus on top, minus on bottom, normally inside a bracket. So, a plus or minus sign in front of the name of a compound of an optically active compound suggests that the sample that is given to you is actually a mixture of both the enantiomers in equal amounts and therefore, not optically active. So, this term racemic mixture is only used for asymmetric compounds, compounds that do not have symmetry or compounds that are optically active, but when they say when they are mentioned as racemic mixtures, they are equal mixtures of both the enantiomers. Now, it is also possible that you start with an enantiomer, you are given an enantiomer and you carry out a chemical reaction and during the process of the reaction, if uh, the optically active compounds converts into optically inactive compounds or probably because the asymmetric center remains there, but however, you end up having both the enantiomers pro formed as products, then such processes are called racemization product, uh, processes or racemization reaction. So, a reaction is said to undergo racemization if uh, the if a pure asymmetric starting material is converted into equal mixtures of enantiomers. That means, a reaction that gives equal mixtures of enantiomers from a single enantiomer are called uh, are said to have undergone racemization. Okay. So, now we will try to put these all things into perspective and then we would try to explain the different terms that are associated with the reaction of asymmetric compounds. So, here uh, in this particular screen what you see here is I have a compound which has a carbon atom that is attached to an ethyl, methyl a hydrogen atom and an X. So, let us say there is an alkyl halide. So, now this alkyl halide is so it is actually a 2 halo butane derivative because there are 4 carbon atoms an ethyl group, methyl group and a carbon that is attached to a halogen and hydrogen. Now, if 
so i have three arrows going in all the direction in three directions so these three arrows represent three different reactions so now let us assume that the reaction is with a nucleophile y with something y so now during the process of the reaction now let us have a look at the one that is to the right side so now when this reaction happens if x is replaced by y but that does not affect the molecule at all so only thing that happened is the carbon x bond broke and y came exactly from the same side and form a new bond so then what you get is the stereochemistry of the molecule remains same so so i could i could show you that so if imagine that this is the molecule that i'm talking about so if this is the x atom that is supposed to go out now imagine that if this goes out and a new thing comes out here so when this happens i have replaced this with this but nothing happened to this part of the molecule it did not undergo an inversion or anything from where the x atom left the y atom has come and joined so if that happens then we say that the molecule has retained its configuration or we say that the reaction underwent retention so the reaction has a retention has a stereochemical outcome that is whatever was the optical activity of this compound that stays so the optical activity or the asymmetric nature of the molecule is not changed then it is called retention now there can be another thing that is where you remove this atom and the new atom comes from the back side so this is exactly what happened in an sn2 reaction so uh, one of the atom goes out but the new atom comes from the opposite direction so that is represented to the left side so this would result that here you can see that in this particular molecule the x is to the left side but in the newly formed molecule a x is pointed uh, to the right side so from the left side at cx bond we get a right side at cy bond now if x and y are same i can actually put a mirror here and you would find that this structure a and the actual structure are mirror images provided x and y are same so uh, in this particular reaction the molecule has undergone an inversion it is as if Uh, the y has come from the side opposite to where the x was and gave us this molecule so this kind of reactions where the stereochemistry of the compound is inverted are said to have undergone an inversion so these are terms that we use uh, when we talk about the reaction of asymmetric organic molecules so now when asymmetric organic molecule undergoes a reaction in which the stereochemistry is retained in which the configuration of the asymmetric carbon atom is retained then we say the reaction has undergone a retention now if the configuration of the asymmetric carbon atom is inverted if the configuration was become something that is similar to the mirror image of the original one then we say that the reaction has undergone an inversion now there can be a third type so in the third type what happens is when the reaction happens i get a mixture of products in equal amounts so that means if Uh, if my starting material here gives a mixture of a and b in equal amounts then we say the reaction has undergone racemization so these are the three terms that you would come across when we talk about the reaction of uh, asymmetric organic molecules either retention retaining the stereochemistry inversion inverting the stereochemistry that means getting the mirror image or racemization where there is half retention and half inversion so these are the three things now we should also note that any reaction so have a look at the last reaction i have on the screen so if you look at this reaction you see there is an oh and we have seen that alcohols can be converted into the corresponding halo compounds on treating with thionyl chloride socl2 so this is a reaction we have learned while we are learning the preparation of haloalkanes now what happens the carbon oxygen bond breaks and the carbon chloride bond forms now this molecule that i have given here is optically active because it has a carbon atom that i am highlighting now this carbon atom is attached to four different groups one is ch2 ch2 oils another is hydrogen and ethyl group and a ch3 but the reaction actually happened on this carbon atom which is not the asymmetric carbon which is not the stereo center and therefore the product is formed with absolute retention of configuration because we have not touched the asymmetric carbon at all so the terms inversion retention and racemization have real sense only when the reaction is happening at the asymmetric carbon atom otherwise the reaction would always retain its stereochemistry because it uh, the reaction does not recognize an asymmetric carbon at all it is happening somewhere else in the molecule so therefore such reactions would uh, we could easily say that they retain so they undergo retention so it is not even worth mentioning because uh, there the asymmetric carbon is not part of not a part of the reaction that is taking place now with this particular idea let us have a relook at uh, nucleophilic substitution reactions so 
the first reaction that we discussed is SN2 reactions which lead to inversion of configuration. So, we said that this reaction generally undergoes an inversion. So, the molecule I have here is 2 bromo octane. So, 2 bromo octane is you can see there is a 6 carbon chain and there is a CH3 and bromine is attached to the second carbon. So, the carbon is attached to 4 different groups it is optically active and this isomer that I have drawn here is the minus isomer that is the, it is the levoro tertiary molecule. Now, if I take minus 2 bromo uh, octane that means uh, the one that is levorotatory and treat it with an hydroxide anion and if the reaction undergoes an SN2 reaction which it would then the product is plus octanol plus octan 2 ol. So, therefore, the stereochemistry of the molecule has inverted. I started with one enantiomer which had a particular optical activity and the product has the opposite optical activity and Br minus comes out. So, therefore, SN2 reactions we can easily say that SN2 reactions always follow inversion. Now, let us have a look at SN1 reaction. In an SN1 reaction, so this is something we discussed today, if I take 2 bromo octane, so it is, um, sorry, the molecule I have here is 2 bromo butane, so this is an error here. So, if you take 2 bromo butane and in, in an SN1 reaction, I would first form this particular carbocation. So, this is 2 bromo butane and 2 bromo butane forms this carbocation. We said that the carbocation is planar. So, this, this species that I have shown here, this is a planar molecule. So, it has CH3, C2H5 and H. Now, this planar molecule is the one which is then going to react with hydroxide anion. Now, the planar molecule has two lobes of p orbital. Now, the OH minus can come either from this side or it can come from this side. Now, if the OH minus is coming from the right side, then the rest of the molecule would bend backwards. So, you can see how my hand would turn. So, initially I have a carbon atom at the middle of my palm and hydrogen atoms on three sides. Now, when the OH minus comes to form a bond, the the rest of the molecule would bend in the opposite direction forming a tetrahedral carbon atom. Now, if it comes from the other side, they will bend in this direction forming a tetrahedral carbon atom. So, now once that happens, the OH has this liberty of coming from either of the sides. So, what we are going to get, we have a planar intermediate. So, the planar intermediate is going to give me two compounds. So, it would be a mixture of uh, plus 2 butanol and minus 2 butanol or plus 2 butan 2 ol and minus 2 butan 2 ol. So, this reaction when an SN1 reaction happens because the intermediate is planar, I would get two products. So, that means the reaction undergoes the racemization. So, SN1 reactions proceed with racemization just because the reaction is able is going through an intermediate which is normal asymmetric. So, once the reaction takes a route in which an asymmetric carbon atom is turned into a planar compound, into a symmetric compound, then the products would be forming in equal amounts. Even if the products are supposed to be asymmetric, you would get both the enantiomers formed in equal amounts and therefore, you get a racemic mixture. So, this particular reaction SN1 uh, leads to racemization, whereas SN2 leads to inversion of configuration. Okay. So, with this I would move into the next reaction of alkyl halides which is elimination reaction. So, elimination reaction of haloalkanes result in the formation of alkenes. So, the reaction can best be represented by what I have shown here. So, there is a base, so which is normally hydroxide anion which is able to pick up a proton from the carbon that is adjacent to the carbon bearing a halogen atom. So, I have a CH2 Br bond. So, this is the haloalkane part and it has a carbon that is attached to a hydrogen. So, this hydrogen is a requirement for an elimination reaction. So, now the hydroxide anion will pick this hydrogen and then the electrons that were between the carbon and hydrogen could be found between this carbon and this carbon forming a new double bond and an HBr comes out. So, the Br minus would go out and the OH would take the H forming water. So, the reaction can be represented like this. This is normally done by taking the haloalkane in alcoholic potassium hydroxide and gently warming the reaction mixture. Now, what is the most interesting part about this reaction is that, so it is a pretty simple reaction to see. So, if there is a carbon atom attached to a halogen atom and if the adjacent carbon atom has a hydrogen, then the base will pick that hydrogen, the halogen will leave forming a double bond between these two carbon atoms. And the carbon bearing the halogen atom is called as alpha and the adjacent carbon atom is called as beta. So, therefore, this reaction which forms this double bond are also called as beta elimination reactions because the two groups are going from alpha and beta from the adjacent carbon atom. So, these are called as beta elimination reactions or they are in short elimination reactions of haloalkanes. Now, uh, have a look at this cyclic uh, structure that I, am, I have drawn here. So, if you look at this particular structure, you can see that uh, I have an iodine attached to a carbon atom 
and this carbon atom has 1, 2, 3. There are 3 carbon atoms adjacent to this particular carbon to which iodine is bonded and all these 3 carbon atoms have hydrogens. So, I have shown these hydrogens as beta 1, beta 2 and beta 2 because these 2 hydrogens are same because they are in the ring and there is another hydrogen atom on a CH3 that is going out. So, I am considering an iodide and that iodide is on the carbon alpha and then there are 3 beta carbon atoms. Out of the 3 beta, 2 of them are similar which are called beta 2 and on these 3 beta carbon atoms there are hydrogen. So, therefore, the iodine can go out now either by taking the hydrogen from beta 1 or by taking hydrogen from beta 2. So, what I would get is a mixture of products, the one which is shown here. So, in this particular compound which I am highlighting now, the hydrogen has gone from the beta 2 carbon atom and in this one the hydrogen has gone from the beta 1 carbon atom. Now, when this reaction is actually carried out, you will find that the major product is the one where hydrogen is lost from the beta 2 carbon atom and uh, the other product where hydrogen is lost from the beta 1 carbon is the minor product. So, this forms a rule. So, this is a general observation. It is you would find this happening in all sorts of compounds and the rule that what does the rule say is this is called as a Seidsev rule which is uh, uh, named after the Russian chemist Alexander Seidsev. So, it has to be pronounced as Seidsev. So, people also write the name differently as Seidsev. So, what Seidsev rule tells you is that when you have these kind of compounds that can give you mixture of alkenes, normally the alkene that is most substituted forms. So, you while studying the re chemistry of alkenes, you would have learned that the more an alkene is substituted, the alkene becomes more and more stable. So, stability of an alkene is associated with uh, the extent of substitution. So, therefore, when there can be two products formed on the same alkene, you would find that the product that gives you the most substituted alkene is the most stable. So, in this case, this alkene is, has three substitutions. So, if I have to name them 1, 2 and 3, you can see that there are three substituents on this alkene. So, it is more stable whereas, in this alkene there are substitutions only on one of the carbon atom, the other carbon atom is a CH2. So, this is less stable. A more clearer example is here. So, if I take 2 bromopentane and treat it with an alkoxide. Now, there are hydrogen atoms on this carbon as well as on this carbon. Now, therefore, it can give me two products and in reality when you carry out this reaction, you would find that uh, the uh, pentuene where the double bond starts from the second carbon is formed in 81 percentage whereas the other one is formed only in 19 percentage. That means, this is the minor product and if you look at the substitution pattern on both the alkenes that are formed, you uh, the one that is more substituted that means, there are two substitutions on the double bond is formed in more amount than the one where there is only one substitution. So, this is a disubstituted alkene, this is a mono substituted alkene and you will see that the mono substituted alkene is formed less. So, that is a Seitz of rule. So, this is the main point to be remembered in elimination reactions. Now, we have learned two reactions here, substitution versus elimination. In substitution, we have a nucleophile coming and replacing the halogen atom and in elimination, we have a base that is picking up the proton. Now, in the example that I have already talked about the elimination, we had an OH minus coming and picking up the proton. So, now OH minus is a nucleophile, you know that and it is also a base sodium hydroxide is a base, but the OH minus is also a nucleophile. Now, what will it like to do? Whether it would like to react in a nucleophilic substitution reaction or whether it would like to give you an elimination reaction by abstracting a proton. So, this is a choice the molecule has, uh, the reaction has. Now, so, so, therefore, always there will be a competition between a substitution and an elimination reaction. That is whether the nucleophile has to act as a base or to act as a nucleophile. So, therefore, this is something of a conflict and whichever reaction is the easiest to happen, that happens. So, therefore, sometimes we may end up having mixtures of elimination and substitution products. So, there are certain rules that we can write down and read out. So, one of them is that a bulkier nucleophile prefer to act as a base and abstract a proton because if the nucleophile is very big. So, I have the example here, you have a look at this structure. So, in this particular case, I have bromide. So, this is isopropyl bromide or 2 bromopropane and the nucleophile I am trying to use here is tertiary butoxide. So, it is um, an alkoxide which is attached to a tertiary butyl group. This is a bulky nucleophile. Now, this nucleophile will find it very difficult to reach the carbon atom to which bromine is bonded. So, it may not reach here. Instead, it is easier for this tertiary butoxide, this uh, alkoxide to pick a proton. So, my nucleophile in this case is bulkier. So, it prefers to act as a base and carry it 
pick out this proton and then make a double bond. So, bulkier nucleophiles would act as bases. Now, a primary alcohol alkyl halide prefers a SN2 reaction. Now, if my alkyl halide is primary, then of course, there is no hindrance whatsoever. So, um, SN2 reactions are very easy. Now, when I go into a secondary alkyl halide, so the, the example that we discussed here is 2 bromopropane, it is a secondary halide. Now, if I use a secondary haloalkane where the bromine is attached to a secondary atom, so have a look at this substitution reaction that is on the right side. Now, if I use methoxide anion as the nucleophile or the base, this is something that can easily attack here and give me an SN2 reaction. Now, if my base becomes bulkier, it would then give me an elimination reaction. So, when you have secondary alkyl halides, there is a choice. Either it can go for SN1 or SN2 or it can go for elimination. And that now depends on the strength of the nucleophile and its size. A larger base, a larger nucleophile would act as a base. So, therefore, in secondary alkyl halide cases, we might end up having mixtures of SN1, SN2 products and sometimes elimination. SN1, when sometimes your nucleophile is not very strong and it is also not a strong base, then it cannot give you elimination, but over a period of time, it can give you an SN1 reaction. Now, tertiary alkyl halides always prefers SN1 or elimination reactions. So, uh, uh, they do not give you SN2 reaction. So, they first form the carbocation and now the carbocation can either lose a proton from a beta carbon atom and form an alkene or it can also give you an SN1 substitution and, touch, and they can also undergo reactions where the base directly picks the proton from the beta carbon uh, and uh, the alkyl halide bond breaks. So, this is how we can summarize them. So, we can say that primary alkyl halides will give you SN2, secondary alkyl halides can give you nucleophilic substitution reactions as well as eliminations and tertiary also can do the same thing. Now, a bulkier nucleophile in general prefers to give you um, uh, in elimination reaction. Okay. So, with this we would uh, come to the last of the reactions of haloalkanes that we would like to discuss here. So, now uh, this particular reaction is reactions of haloalkanes with metals. Now, we know that a carbon halogen bond generally is polarized. So, we have a negative charge on the halogen atom and a positive charge on the carbon atom. Now, when such compounds are treated with certain metals, what the metals would do is metals would break the carbon halogen bond because halide anions are stable, they want to be associated with metals in many cases. So, then what we would get is a metal halide that is formed along with a carbon metal bond. And in many cases, this carbon metal bond that is formed would be considerably covalent, so that means it is directional, they do not stay as ion, carbanion do not stay as a carbanion in all the cases, it would normally be linked to the metal that is being used. So, we can say that if a compound contains metal carbon bond of some sort, then they are called as organometallic compounds. So, organometallic compounds are compounds where there is a carbon metal bond and normally certain metals are good in this because they would form stabler bonds, directional bonds just like a covalent bond with the carbon atom and such compounds are called as organometallic compounds. Now, the most discussed and the first and the most recognized organometallic compound is a Grignard reagent. So, this is named after Victor Grignard who discovered these molecules in 1900. So, you can see that it is more than 100 years that this compound has been discovered. So, now uh, how he, he did that was when he take an alkyl halide. So, in this case, I have written bromoethane and if it is treated with magnesium, metallic magnesium in dry ether. So, the solvent that is being used should be something that will not react with the metal. So, when a when an haloalkane is treated with magnesium in a solvent such as dry ether, it would give a product where there is a metal carbon bond, a magnesium carbon bond and a magnesium bromine bond. Now, the MgBr is actually an ionic bond. So, it is most likely an Mg plus and a Br minus. So, they uh, it can be treated as any of the salts of magnesium with any halogen atom. So, it is uh, mostly an ionic bond whereas, the carbon magnesium bond is covalent in nature. So, the carbon magnesium bond, carbon and magnesium are associated together with a Br minus uh, around. So, the magnesium effectively can be said to be in plus 2 oxidation state where most of the negative charge is centered on the carbon atom and bromine atom and magnesium bears this 2 positive charge. So, although the metal carbon bond in a Grignard reagent is directional, is mostly covalent that is highly polarized. So, it is polarized to such an extent that the carbon can almost be assumed 
uh, to be bearing a negative charge in that. So, it is a negatively charged carbon atom, positively charged magnesium linked through a covalent bond, a rather covalent bond and then there is a Br minus. So, this is exactly opposite to what can happen to an alkyl halide. So, in the alkyl halide we have seen that the carbon has a positive charge and the halogen has a negative charge. Here it is the opposite. Now, therefore, these compounds are very reactive. So, a Grignard reagent is not something that you can take outside, you can something that you can keep on a table or anything because uh, exposed to air because it reacts with moisture, it reacts with uh, alcohols, it reacts with anything that has an exchangeable hydrogen. So, I have represented that with the reaction here. So, if you take Grignard reagent and treat this one with an alcohol, what happens is uh, the carbon metal bond breaks with the negative charge on the carbon reacting with the proton of the alcohol and giving in this case because we have used an ethyl magnesium bromide, it reacts with the hydrogen of the ROH and gives me ethane plus MgORx where OR is the alkoxide anion. So, now this compound MgORx is rather a salt where magnesium is bonded to a halide anion as well as to an alkoxide anion. So, it gives a salt along with a hydrocarbon. So, this is what would happen even unintentionally if a Grignard reagent is exposed to an alcohol or just to moisture. So, if you keep it open uh, the moisture from the atmosphere is enough to make this reaction happen and therefore, this reaction would go ahead and start giving us this product. Okay. Now, uh, similarly, there is another reaction called as Wood's reaction. So, this particular reaction is normally used to prepare hydrocarbons, not so much of synthetic applications per se because it is a rather violent reaction. Now, uh, what does the reaction do is if you take alkyl halide in the presence of sodium, metallic sodium, the carbon halogen bond breaks, sodium takes out uh, the halide. Unlike magnesium, sodium can only have one valency. So, sodium would take out the halide and therefore, what we would have is a naked carbon atom which was earlier attached to the halogen atom. So, two such alkyl groups would combine together and give us a hydrocarbon with double the number of carbon atoms to the haloalkane that we started with. So, it can be represented with the reaction that is written here. So, if you take an alkyl halide, two molecules of the alkyl halide would react with two atoms of sodium giving us a hydrocarbon that has an extended carbon chain which is twice the number of total carbon atoms in the haloalkane plus two molecules of sodium halide. So, this reaction is called as a Wood's reaction it can be considered as a coupling reaction where two alkyl groups can be coupled together. You start with the alkyl halide, you clip off both the halogen atoms, they go out as a salt with sodium and then the two alkyl groups are coupled together to give us a hydrocarbon. So, this is a reaction of uh, haloalkanes with metal. So, two important reactions out of which the Grignard reagent is always the most important because it gives us a reagent that has a negatively charged carbon atom whereas the Wood's reaction only gives you a product which is a hydrocarbon. So, its applications are limited with respect to that. Okay. So, with this we would be able to summarize the reactions of haloalkanes. So, there are three reaction main classes of reactions that we studied. One of them was substitution reactions which follows SN1 and SN2, second one was elimination reactions and the third one was reaction with metals. Now, substitution reactions can be used to make a large number of functionalized organic molecules depending on the nucleophile that we use. Now, their reaction pathway is generally SN1 or SN2, SN1 follows uh, would result in racemization if the haloalkane is asymmetric. SN2 would result in inversion that means, if we start with a particular configuration of an asymmetric carbon atom, we get the opposite configuration in the product. Then of course, these reactions can also have uh, lead to the formation of alkenes and once alkenes are formed, we get the alkene that is most substituted which is called as the sage of rule. Haloalkanes can also form Grignard reaction, the, uh, Grignard reagents that is the important thing about the third class of reactions that we discussed. So, with this I would stop here and uh, but in the next uh, class that we would have on this topic, we would talk about the reactions of haloarenes which are actually different from the reaction of haloalkanes. Thank you very much.